group Audubon community. Got it. Um, uh, talk to the community about the, uh, the, the thrill of exploring one of the most underburdened countries in the world. So um, today's talk is gonna center around four main topics. Uh, first, I'm gonna talk about what makes Saudi Arabia an exciting country for, for birding. Um, then um, I'll talk about the uh, endemic species uh, that Anne mentioned, uh, as well as near endemic species. Um, you know, what, what really makes Saudi special um, and now that it's open to international tourism, um, it's, 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 it's going to be a, a, a big boon for the country's ecotourism industry. Uh, these these uh, unique species that, that only exist here. Um, next, I'll talk about places in the kingdom to, to bird and the best times to visit. Um, so not everyone visits uh, Saudi specifically for birding and maybe they won't have the time to visit the Southwest where um, all of the endemic species are, but uh, no matter where you go in the kingdom, you'll find uh, excellent birding. So I just want to talk about um, those, those, um, those primary regions uh, where you can see some great birds uh, and where most people could expect to go, like uh, Riyadh, for example, or, or in the east uh, where, where Jim uh, was based. Um, and lastly, I'm going to talk about why uh, I personally love Saudi birding, um, uh, why it's, uh, I've found it uh, so fulfilling over the past four years. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen with you guys and we'll get started. Make sure that I get the sound, okay. All right, so please let me know if there's any issues viewing my screen. Does it look okay? Okay. Um, so no need to see there's, let me just, let me keep the chat open. Now um, to start, um, I thought it'd be interesting to see what comes to mind uh, for everyone at the thought of bird watching in Saudi Arabia. So um, if you just came in, uh, you may not see the link for this activity uh, in the chat. So uh, what you can do here is uh, scan the QR code uh, with the, the camera on your smartphone. Uh, and this will take you directly to the activity. Uh, and in the activity, you're just going to write three individual words that come to mind when you think about bird watching uh, in a place like Saudi Arabia. Um, if the code, if you're not sure how to scan the QR code or um, the, it's, uh, it, it's not working for you for any reason, oh, thank you, Anne. Uh, you can go to menti.com uh, and just post, posted this in the chat and then enter the eight digit code that you see there. So 9607-3245. Uh, once you've done that, you'll be prompted to write the three words. Um, so I'm gonna give you guys just a couple minutes to do this. Um, some of you have already submitted ideas. And then when you're done, we'll see what comes up. Um, this is going to create a word cloud uh, with, with all of the ideas that came to mind for you. And I expect certain words are going to recur um, and those words will be featured large in the, in the word cloud. So go ahead, uh, menti.com, enter that eight digit code. And then we're gonna take a look at what appears here on the screen. So it looks like we have five responses so far. So like I said, I'll give you a minute or two to submit your words and then we'll get started. Oh, maybe. Just thinking, maybe you still want to scan that QR code. So let me keep that visible for you. And there's that numeric code again in the chat. OK, 
Okay, Let's see six responses. One more minute. One more minute, and then we'll see what we got. Yeah, so good question. Um, I'll, I'll be talking about that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, and it's, it's one of the things that makes um, birding in Saudi really exciting, um, kind of like Texas in that way, uh, where, where things really heat up when, when um, migration is underway. All right, so let's take a look. Um, if, you, if you haven't had a chance to submit your ideas yet, don't worry. Uh, go ahead, finish uh, submitting those words. Uh, and as we, as we talk about your ideas, uh, those words will still appear. So, interesting. Let me uh, zoom in here. Oops, maybe not too much. Let's see. Uh, and as you see there, right at the center of this is the word desert. So, uh, you know, desert comes to mind for more of you when you think of Saudi and what it's like to bird in Saudi. Um, dry, hot, warm. Warm would be a serious understatement. Uh, extremely hot would be a little more accurate, uh, but only during the summer. Uh, interesting. Uh, shorebirds, that is an interesting one because yeah, Saudi is phenomenal for shorebirds. Um, windy, it can get quite windy here and with, uh, with uh, yeah, the I'm sure Jim could tell us as well. The uh, the dust and sandstorms out here uh, can be pretty epic. Um, water sources. There's not a lot of uh, not, not a lot of fresh water out here. But um, some of the big projects here are uh, desalination. Uh, so lots of desalination plants to produce the drinking water. Um, tall buildings for sure in the capital, right? Uh, beauty, rare, exotic. Um, you know, even till today, um, it, it has an exotic feel to it. Uh, I lived in the UAE for seven years and uh, things can feel quite normal in that country. Uh, but in Saudi, Saudi keeps its edge. Uh, it's, it, and it, 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 it lends to its charm uh, for sure. Um, scrub sparrows, definitely there's a lot of uh, species that, that um, love the scrubbier habitats and we'll be, we'll be looking at some of those during the presentation. And then of course, oil, oil and gas. So uh, I'm an English teacher, but uh, I teach English with Saudi Aramco, which is the national oil company. Um, so um, they, um, they, 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 they pay the rent as it were. Um, so absolutely, right, uh, desert. When we think of bird watching in Saudi, we think of a whole lot of desert. But um, while it's true, that let me zoom out a little bit so we can see. Okay. Sorry, it's one second. Let me just zoom out, reposition this. Good. Now, um, while it's true that 95% of Saudi Arabia is desert, what is also true is that, as Christopher Bowen, an Australian ornithologist who recently worked at Aramco, put it, the desert is not deserted. And what that means, what Chris meant by this, is that the seeming barrenness uh, of the terrain in Saudi Arabia, in fact, belies this rich uh, avian diversity. Um, uh, and and um, it's, it lends to the excitement of, of being in a country like Saudi Arabia. And the one thing that we can say, though, is that there isn't just, um, you know, Saudi desert doesn't just mean generic rolling dunes that most people often think of. Uh, there are several uh, distinct types of desert in the kingdom, and each desert has its own unique array of bird species. And the most emblematic of which are perhaps from the lark sparrow, uh, excuse me, the lark family. Um, you guys of lark sparrows before uh, the uh, the lark family. Uh, these are these are really the the iconic birds of the desert in Saudi Arabia, and just to give you a taste of uh, some of the different desert types here, I have some images of the desert types along with 
some of the, the, um, the lark species that you can see there. Um, so for example, we've got the great sand deserts of Arabia, right, including the vast uh, Rub al-Khali, uh, it's the empty quarter. And these are some of the least biodiverse places on earth. Uh, this is actually probably a little more central, this one, but imagine the Rub al-Khali, you can remove this mountain in the back and you just have a vast sea of sand. Uh, it's massive. It's the biggest sand desert in the world. Um, but even here, right, um, we've got lark species. So uh, this is the greater hoopoo lark. And this is one of the very few bird species that are tough enough to, to live throughout the year in the sand deserts of Saudi. Uh, we can find them in other habitats, but it's, more, like I said, one of the, the few birds that can actually survive out in the sand deserts. Um, here in the eastern region, um, we have uh, generally not, uh, it's, it's a little more level, um, the, the, the desert, not so much of the rolling dunes. There, there are some dunes in places, uh, but most of it's dominated by sand gravel desert with these uh, sandstone mountains and escarpments. Um, and this habitat, oh, I had to throw in, uh, I had to throw in camels here. I make a little comment too, that um, if you go to the UAE, like Dubai or Abu Dhabi, the camels are all a single color. But here in Saudi, there's three different colors and, and they're, uh, they're featured here in this image. Uh, they, we have the light ones, which are called Wudah. And we have these uh, reddish brown ones called the uh, Hamra. And then we have the dark ones called Mujahin. Um, and each one, apparently one tastes better than the other. One produces better milk than the other. And then one's a, a better racer. Uh, so I've, I can't remember how it goes, but uh, really beautiful, beautiful camels here. Um, but it's these sandstone mountains where you find um, the desert lark. And uh, this is the Azizai subspecies, uh, which is the palest subspecies of the desert larks. Um, and it can only be found in the eastern region of Saudi Arabia. Um, I think into in Bahrain, they get it as well, as well as Qatar. Um, now, uh, expanses of flat or gently rolling sand gravel desert, um, like the one that my wife is in here, right? she's, she's scanning the desert for birds for us. Um, these deserts extend throughout the central, northern and northwest regions of the kingdom. And it is really, really barren. I mean, this is incredibly barren um, and, and often quite featureless. Uh, but uh, in this habitat, we find the bar-tailed lark, uh, which is um, a daintier, cuter lark. Um, and uh, it's very, very determined, very well adapted for its life in the extreme heat and the intense solar radiation of, uh, of the Saudi deserts. Um, and this one can be found throughout the year, uh, even uh, during the, uh, the, the peak heat of the summer. Um, and they, they're adapted for survival. Um, really incredible birds and quite cute. Um, definitely one of my favorites. Now, um, this, uh, so the sand gravel deserts like we see here, um, initially, they might strike the eye as featureless, right? But if you look for areas of shallow washes, like the one that you see here uh, beside my, that my wife is standing beside, these shallow washes, um, this is where the water will flow during the, 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 the rainstorms. And it maybe rains like once or twice, right? It's uh, significant rainfall, maybe once or twice a year. Um, and this is where uh, the, the, the water will flow. And these are the most vegetated places uh, in these real sort of wide open expanses of desert. Um, and uh, after the rains, it, uh, these places will host the periodic growth of ephemeral plants like grasses. And it's in these habitats. So generally the, the bar-tailed larks will be out kind of less vegetated areas uh, in this terrain. Uh, but in, in, in this area, these shallow washes with the vegetation, um, you will uh, you might find the Arabian lark, uh, which is uncommon. It took me quite a while to find it. Um, uh, it took me three years, in fact, uh, before I saw my first. Uh, this Arabian lark. Let me jump ahead. So this is um, this is similar terrain here. 
um, but more specifically where you would find the Arabian lark, right? Sand gravel, um, this is where the water will flow. We have these sort of uh, woody, uh, woody shrubs uh, growing in places and there's compacted sand as well. Um, often the uh, compacted sand will, will occur along the banks of these washes uh, with the vegetation coming through. And that's where we go and look for this bird, which is the Arabian lark. Um, so this is a near endemic, which means that uh, it's, it's um, basically 90% of its population is found in Saudi Arabia. While some, some do occur in Israel, uh, they've occurred in Jordan as well. Uh, I think in a couple places in uh, one place in Oman, one place in Yemen. But the bulk of them are here in Saudi Arabia. And like I said, they're they can be quite difficult to find. Um, and a lot of birders are excited to visit Saudi and go out into the desert and in the, in the hopes of finding these birds. Um, and they were uh, actually recently split from Dun's lark, which occurs in Africa and they were declared a distinct species. Uh, so it, 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 um, it, it's generated a lot more buzz and a lot more interest uh, for, for birders uh, who, like to, who like to list, who like to travel around the world and, and uh, add these new species, um, more interest for them to, to get into the kingdom and, and come see these birds. Now, um, so the desert birding, the, the one, I, I love desert birding because of the wildness of the terrain, uh, you know, especially exploring the desert mountains and, and the chance to encounter these in, intriguing species like, uh, like the, the Arabian lark. Um, it, it, it's, I find it really thrilling, um, but it can also be quite slow. So you can go out to a place like that and maybe come away with 12 species uh, with a day's effort. Um, however, right, um, this is the, the Saudi I've come to love, which is um, first off my local patch. Uh, this is Al Asfar Lake. And um, Al Asfar is, um, there's uh, just different wetland habitat here that just make it super exciting. Um, and it's a place that I go to throughout the year. So even during the hottest months of summer, uh, I can go out to these wetlands, uh, out to this lake and there are birds there. Uh, and the, the cast of characters changes with the season. So uh, it can be quite active um, uh, during the summer uh, with, with an array of uh, summer breeders uh, that I don't see uh, during other times of the year. And so we've got, uh, we've got this, this uh, short grass wetland here and uh, we've got the Phragmites, there's some, some pools, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, open water as well at this location where uh, we see a lot of um, cormorants and um, cormorants and gulls, terns, um, as well as the occasional duck. <laughs> the occasional duck. Uh, most of the ducks have learned to avoid this place uh, because there are lots of hunters. Um, and there's the the marsh again. And uh, I I bet you didn't imagine there was a marsh this large in a place like Saudi Arabia, but um, to be honest, this is not natural habitat though. Um, all of this water is coming from Al Hassa, the, 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 the larger region where I lived. Uh, it's uh, treated wastewater that's pumped out into the desert, uh, but it's created this massive lake, uh, this huge, uh, huge marshlands um, that uh, have been around for about 50 plus years now. So um, the, the birds have come to rely on it as a stopover. Um, so this is the place I go throughout the year to kind of scratch my, my birding itch when, when maybe desert birding is a little too uncomfortable, a little too, little too iffy in terms of safety. Uh, you want to avoid the desert in the middle of summer. Um, but the place in Saudi, oh yeah, before I get to that, sorry, I'm going to talk about the, the, some of the birds that I see there at the lake. Um, so some, some of the ones that I can count on, um, uh, really striking species like the squacko heron, uh, which is a little bit bigger than the least bittern, this one, uh, quite beautiful. Uh, when they fly, their wings are pure white. So it's actually predominantly a white heron once you, once you see it in flight. Uh, and just uh, the, the back here is, um, and, um, and along the nape, these nice colors. Oops, oops, sorry, hold on a second. I just jumped into, slideshow mode. 
Uh, we've got the gray-headed swamp pen, a uh, really, really uh, stunning species that actually only recently colonized the lake. Uh, so it's uh, spreading into Saudi and around Saudi now. Um, and uh, now is quite common at the lake to see it every, every visit. And we also have um, uh, the mustache warbler among some other reed loving species, uh, uh, other reed warbler species uh, that will, um, most of them are there throughout the year. Um, and this one becomes really conspicuous during the, during the winter. Now, uh, but the, the place I wanted to talk about that I've really come to know and love is the west of Saudi. And unfortunately my work, let me see here. Unfortunately, my work um, is in the east. So if, if I could, I would, I would definitely spend all my time out west because it's really incredible out there. Um, so we get these nice, nice highlands, um, highland wadis that are dominated by uh, acacia trees, uh, which are really, really bird friendly places. Um, this is these, these acacia wadis and some of the dry mountains with the acacias are where you can find species like uh, the Arabian green bee eater, uh, which um, has been proposed. It's all, it also goes by the name little green bee eater, um, but it has been proposed uh, to be a distinct species, um, the, one, the one here in Arabia. So in time, it may be another endemic bird for Arabia. Um, we also have some, some nice uh, lowland areas, uh, farms uh, in the West. Um, and um, the, these, this picture, so this picture here, just to say, this is from Al Baha, uh, my recent visit in Al Baha, uh, an area quite beautiful, um, just off the mountains. Um, and you can get some nice, uh, nice um, kind of lowland species out West. And then, you know, the best place to visit though are the highlands. So this is a region of highlands in the Jazan province uh, in a place called Jebel Fefa. And Jebel Fefa is only 10 kilometers, uh, about uh, four miles from the Yemen border. Uh, and in fact, this picture here is actually looking out towards uh, peaks in Yemen. Uh, so it's quite close to the border, but this area is, is quite safe. Um, so no, no, no threat to visitors to this area, despite being so close to, to, to Yemen, where, where the conflict is ongoing. And the birds though, the birds are phenomenal. Uh, for example, this is a, um, this is called the little rock thrush, uh, which is an African species, which also occurs in Southwest Arabia. Uh, we have the Bruce's green pigeon. So another African species really just striking, amazing bird uh, that uh, is uh, quite, quite common uh, in Southwest Saudi, up in the highlands particularly, um, and uh, especially during the summer. We have the African paradise flycatcher. Uh, so this is a male with the white, uh, white tail plumes. Uh, these are summer visitors. Um, they actually believe they all winter in Africa and uh, they, they come to breed up in the highlands of Saudi. And we have, these are all African birds uh, <laughs> that I'm featuring here. Uh, the uh, African gray hornbill, uh, which is really incredible. Uh, this you tend to find in, at lower elevations in the Southwest. Um, and just, it's always exciting to see them. They're, they're quite common in the Southwest in, in the right areas, especially around farms. Uh, but just, just to see a, see a hornbill, um, any hornbill is just, it always blows me away. They're really wonderful birds. Um, but the, the, the best place to go and the place that, you know, um, international birders are, are, are going to want to go is the, the extreme highlands in the Southwest. So we're getting up over maybe 7,500 feet, 7,000 to 9,000 feet in elevation. Uh, and here the, uh, the terrain is dominated by juniper trees, African junipers. Um, so this is near, this is south of Al Baha. And these are all African juniper trees uh, behind me. And here's a, here's a wadi dominated by junipers. And this is the place to find so here's another area with junipers and acacia trees in this picture. 
These are the two main trees in the highland. And this is the place to find the Arabian endemic. So any place where you're gonna have lots of woodlands, then what would you expect? You'd expect to find uh, woodpeckers. And that is true of Arabia. We have an endemic woodpecker that only lives in Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, and only in, in these habitats, uh, they, they, um, the, the, the highland terrain dominated by acacia and um, the juniper trees. Uh, really, really wonderful birds, really fun. Um, they can be a little tricky to find sometimes, but uh, I've, I've been lucky to see them several times. There's also the Yemen thrush, another one that only occurs in Saudi and Yemen. And um, this, is, this is really the bird for Saudi Arabia. It's the Asir magpie. Uh, and this is one that's only found in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, its population is declining. It's quite small at the moment, but uh, I've heard that there's a conservation uh, effort that's, uh, that's just getting underway that'll hopefully um, ensure that these, these uh, birds don't go extinct. Um, but uh, they live in a very small area in the highlands between around, um, you know, I'd say 7,500 feet up to, up to 9,000 feet uh, in elevation. So they're, they're kind of on an island basically, uh, especially with, uh, with climate change, uh, which is it, in fact has uh, dramatically affected the highlands, uh, the highland ecosystems uh, in Saudi Arabia over the past you know, 20, 30 years. And here we've got the Yemen linnet. Uh, so it's a little, a little finch um, that lives in uh, only in Saudi and Yemen as well. So another, another special bird to look for in the highlands here. Um, and quite pretty as well, gray heads and kind of um, the Arabic name is Tufahi, Tufahi, uh, Hasun Tufahi. And Tufah is the word for apple. Uh, so that's a reference to the color on the belly of these birds. All right, so let me get to it uh, and uh, uh, let's move on to the next topic, which is what makes Saudi Arabia an exciting country for birding? So ultimately what makes Saudi such an interesting place to bird is the rich avian diversity that you wouldn't expect in a country dominated by desert. And what makes the country so bird rich well, it, first off, it's uh, that Saudi Arabia is situated uh, at the meeting point of three biogeographical realms or uh, ecozones, excuse me. Um, so as we see here in the map of the world, it's broken up into these uh, dominant um, biogeographical uh, realms. And this is uh, Saudi Arabia here. Um, before I talk about those, um, those ecozones, let me just get everyone situated. So we're, we're in the Middle, Middle East and Saudi is here between uh, the Red Sea to the west and the Persian Gulf to the east. And some of the countries to know, we've got uh, Yemen to the south here. And to the southeast, we have Oman. Uh, the small country here to the east is the United Arab Emirates or the UAE. Uh, where the cities of uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi are located. Uh, and the small little nub of a country there is Qatar. Uh, and then on the other side of the Red Sea, we have Egypt, Sudan. Um, across the Persian Gulf, we have Iran, this large country on the other side. And then of course, here to the north is Iraq, uh, here to the northwest, Jordan. And then Israel and Palestine are there um, on the Mediterranean coast. Um, so we've got three, so Saudi is situated between three of these biogeographical realms, which are um, represented by, you know, different uh, families of birds, uh, different habitat types, and um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of birds originating from these ecozones uh, occur also in Saudi. So roughly the northern third of the country is included in what's called the Western Palearctic. So this whole area to the north is the Palearctic, and there's the Western Palearctic and the Eastern Palearctic. 
so um, this portion of Saudi is considered part of the Western Palearctic. And um, there are a lot of uh, red, Palearctic resident species uh, and regional endemics that occur here in the north, uh, including 10 resident lark species, such as the Temminck's lark, thick-billed, and Arabian lark. Uh, so we already saw a picture of the Arabian lark, but I'll show you pictures of the Temminck's and thick-billed in just a bit. And these are three of the most iconic uh, bird species from, from this part of the country, uh, particularly the desert birding in this part of the country. Um, Saudi also hosts approximately 500 million migratory birds from the Palearctic on their annual passage to Africa or wintering grounds elsewhere in Arabia. So upwards to 500 million birds pass through Saudi every year uh, uh, from Eurasia to the north to Africa uh, and Southern Arabia. Um, then in the West, particularly the Southwest, uh, the bird life becomes increasingly dominated by Afrotropical species, uh, especially the further South you go. So uh, we'll, we'll see some examples of this uh, a little bit later. Um, now these Afrotropical species, uh, so yeah, Jazan, Jazan province, this is, um, this is the extreme Southwest of Saudi. But uh, this area contains the highest number of species that range across Sub-Saharan Africa, and their ranges only just extend into Arabia in this region, here in the Southwest, as well as West and South Yemen, and this, uh, an area of so uh, Southern Oman called the Bifar region. Um, some of these species are resident year round, such as uh, white-browed kukul and African gray hornbill, uh, whereas others only visit the kingdom as summer breeders. Uh, such as the Bruce's green pigeon, uh, gray-headed kingfisher, and the African paradise flycatcher, which we saw a picture of earlier. Um, then here in the east, this is where I live, here in the eastern side of the country, um, Saudi bird life here is enriched with species from the Indo-Malayan realm. Um, so the ranges of some predominantly Asian species like uh, gray Franklin, um, the gray-headed swamp hen, which we saw a picture of earlier, uh, red wattled lapwing, and Indian roller uh, extend into Arabia here with uh, greater diversity and density here in the UAE and Northern Oman. So you get way more of the, uh, the Indo-Malayan species in the Southeast corner of the Arabian Peninsula, but we're, get, we get, um, we're getting um, more of them here in the Eastern province of Saudi Arabia. All right, let me just go to my next page of notes. Um, the number of Indo-Malayan species can increase with the arrival of uncommon winter visitors, uh, such as uh, Oriental honey buzzard, uh, black-eared kite, Oriental skylark, as well as uh, the odd vagrant, uh, rufous back red star and purple sunbird. Now, um, no other family no other family better represents what it means to be at the crux of these three biogeographical realms than the rollers. So unlike any other country in the region, Saudi in fact boasts three roller species. Uh, each one hails from a different ecozone. So we've got the European roller, and this is a Palearctic migrant. So it migrates from Eurasia to Africa every, um, every year, uh, every spring and fall and passes through Saudi. Um, here we have the Indian roller. So this is an uh, Indo-Malayan species, uh, which is quite common in the UAE and Northern Oman. And it's, it's increasing, uh, sightings of it are increasing here in Saudi as well. A uh, very, very striking bird uh, that we see in the East. Um, and then in the Southwest, uh, we have yet another Afrotropical species. Uh, this is the Abyssinian roller. Uh, which um, is fairly common, but only very local uh, in the extreme Southwest corner uh, of the country. Now, um, in addition to being situated between these eco zones, um, Saudi is also crossed by three major, um, major flyways. Uh, so we have along the Red Sea, uh, we have uh, the Black Sea Mediterranean flyway. And this flyway sees significant spring and fall passage, uh, particularly of raptors uh, like European honey buzzards, 
uh, and step buzzards, uh, which are which are like uh, like hawks, um, cranes, um, and passerines, uh, so small songbirds. And at the right time of year, for example, it's not unusual to see flocks of uh, a couple hundred or more demoiselle cranes passing over Jeddah. Um, I haven't experienced this yet, unfortunately. Uh, it's it's something I really hope to witness, but. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of, of demoiselle cranes, these, these really elegant, uh, beautiful cranes uh, pass through, um, pass down this flyway, uh, up and down this flyway each year. Um, but what I have witnessed just recently in Albaha were hundreds of European honey buzzards passing through, which was, which was quite a sight. Um, now the other flyway here, we've, uh, another one here is the, um, the, uh, the, excuse me, the, Asian East African flyway. And this one crosses Saudi from the north, uh, the northeast to the southwest. And um, along this flyway, right, um, the, the Saudi represents a major stopover for the shorebirds, like we mentioned earlier. Uh, shrikes, um, there are a lot of shrike species that uh, we can see in Saudi. Um, um, and a lot of them are using, are coming down this flyway and passing through Saudi. Some of them, in fact, overwintering um, and along with weed ears and pipits as well. So a lot of weed ear species, a lot of pipit species, a lot of sh uh, shrike species, um, really, really, um, uh, really visible birds during migration. They can, you can see them out on lawns, uh, you know, perched around gardens um, as they make their way through the country. And lastly, we have here, this pink line is the Central Asian flyway. Uh, and this flyway brings in uh, an interesting array of resident winter species uh, from the stepland of countries like Kazakhstan. This is Kazakhstan up here in the, the upper right corner. Um, so birds like the sociable lapwing, uh, the steppe eagle and hubara bustard, uh, they, they breed up up in this area in the spring and summer, and then they winter, um, many of them winter here in Saudi uh, in the, the, the east and central part of the country. And unfortunately, all three of those species are endangered or threatened. So um, uh, conservation of these birds in Kazakhstan is critical, of course, but uh, as is the, the, their conservation, their protection in Saudi, which is a critical wintering ground for, for the three. Um, so to date, to date, so those are the, the three flyways uh, that pass through Saudi. Now to date, um, uh, as Anne mentioned, over 500 species have been recorded. I, I've lost track of the exact number because uh, we've added uh, quite a few in the past few years. Um, just the past two years alone, we've added six species. Uh, we have the Amur falcon, uh, which was first um, recorded by a Saudi bird watcher by the name of Abdullah Hussein al Sheikh. Um, we have pale sand martin. Uh, so this uh, Amur falcon uh, is an Asian species uh, that migrates from Asia, from East Asia, uh, every year to Africa. But it usually gives Arabia a pass, uh, especially Saudi Arabia. Uh, but uh, um, Abdullah was lucky uh, in 2020 uh, that, that one made a stop um, near his patch uh, in, the, the, in Eastern Saudi Arabia. Um, pale Sand Martin, um, this is, or Pale Martin as it's also known, uh, is a Central Asian species that usually winters in India. And last winter, I discovered a few out of the lake. Uh, this is in fact the marshland that you saw me standing before with my scope. Uh, these birds were out in the center of it, and I had to purchase a pair of waders just to get close enough to actually ID them. Um, here we have the Syrian sarin. It's not the greatest of pictures, a documentary shot of when I discovered them in the northwest of the country, uh, near Jordan, uh, Sinai Peninsula, um, that, that, that region in Saudi Arabia. Uh, this was a first record last year, the Syrian sarin. Um, another Saudi bird watcher by the name of uh, Nader Fahad the Shimari, uh, he found um, not only Saudi's first uh, white-throated swallow, this is nor the Northern Hemisphere's first white-throated swallow. 
this is a species that uh, occurs in uh, Southern Africa. Um, I think it's, it hadn't been recorded north of Tanzania uh, up until this point. So this was a first record for Saudi. This was a first record for the Palearctic. This was the first record for the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, really incredible uh, discovery. Um, recently, uh, we've been visited by African um, open bill. These are African open bill storks. Uh, they've invaded from Africa recently. Uh, they've been seen in Oman. They've been seen as far east as India. Uh, first time ever uh, on, on record, I believe. Uh, and we've got two that have been hanging out in a lake in southwest Saudi. Uh, unfortunately, I haven't been able to make it down to see them, but uh, incredible birds. I, I wish I could. And um, most recently, I was up where, where Jim was telling me that uh, he was working uh, close to the Kuwait border. Um, there we have another Prinia species that occurs. And this is the, we weren't really sure um, uh, here in, in, in Al Hassa, where I live, we have what's called the graceful Prinia. So it's a small, very visually very similar to this bird, just a small brown warbler with a really long uh, active tail. Um, but this species was recently split into two and um, we weren't sure if we had both. Um, so just recently I discovered up near the Kuwait border that in fact both do occur, occur in Saudi. Uh, so that was really exciting. So now let's let's get into it with the endemics. So this is this is the honestly the the biggest draw for international birders. Uh, I have people contacting me all the time about um, you know planning a trip to 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 come to Saudi to see these birds. Um, now there are fourteen endemic species that can be seen in Saudi Arabia, uh, including the Asir magpie. Uh, which we saw earlier. This is the Asir, Asir magpie here. And uh, this is a critically endangered corvid, uh, like I mentioned, um, and it's only found in Saudi. Uh, it's estimated that there may be um, little more than 100 breeding pairs of these birds left. Um, and on account of uh, some uh, habitat loss due to a few different factors, but probably, probably the biggest of which is climate change. Uh, these, um, they're, they're losing their habitat and their numbers appear to be um, uh, in, in decline. Um, now, uh, this, this is the only one that's endemic exclusively to Saudi. Um, and we also have the, um, uh, all of the, excuse me, all of the rest of these. So, so the Asir magpie is the only one that's endemic exclusively to Saudi. Uh, the other 13 can be seen in some of the other uh, countries uh, on the Arabian Peninsula, primarily Yemen, uh, but there, some of these birds can also be seen in Oman. Uh, so for example, the uh, Arabian grosbeak that we see here, uh, this is a bird that also occurs uh, in Yemen and Oman. Uh, and Oman is actually the easiest place to see this bird. Uh, but as for the other species, right, uh, Saudi is in fact the, the easiest, um, easiest place to get into, to be honest, uh, to see these birds um, on account of the, the ongoing conflict in Yemen. So we've got, um, we've got two part uh, endemic partridges uh, in Arabia, uh, both of which can be seen in Saudi in the, in the Southwest. This is the Arabian partridge, and this is the Philby's partridge. So the Philby's only in Saudi and Yemen, uh, the Arabian, uh, Saudi, Yemen, as well as Southern Oman. Uh, we have two endemic owls. Uh, we have the small Arabian scops owl, which, which I reckon is a little bit smaller than the screech owl, the Eastern screech owl. Um, then we have the, um, the Arabian eagle owl, uh, which is probably about the same size as the great horned owl. Uh, we have the, that woodpecker we met earlier. So the, this is the Arabian woodpecker. Um, really incredible, can only be seen in Saudi and Yemen. Um, then we have, this is the Yemen warbler, uh, which can only be seen in Saudi and Yemen as well. Uh, and in the highlands, uh, this, this one really likes to be, to be high up, 7,500 feet up to, up to 9,000, which is the, um, pretty much the highest elevation in the country. Uh, the Yemen thrush, 
which we, we met earlier as well. Um, this is the Arabian wheat ear, uh, which occurs in Saudi, Yemen, and Southern Oman also, uh, as with the, the, the growth speak here. Um, we have the Arabian waxbill, uh, which is a really, really adorable little bird. Um, I, I love every time I see them. Uh, and this is one that occurs only in Saudi and Yemen. Um, we have Arabian or olive rumped sarin. Um, it's called olive rumped in the eBird checklist, uh, but it also goes by the name Arabian sarin. Um, and we have the Yemen sarin. So two very drab endemic um, uh, finch species, but uh, they have uh, particularly the Arabian sarin, the, the sweetest, sweetest uh, voices, sweetest songs. Um, and then lastly, the Yemen linnet, uh, which we saw earlier. Now, uh, as I mentioned, you know, all of these, with the exception of the Arabian gross feet, uh, can be seen easily in Saudi Arabia. So um, anyone planning a trip like that to targeting these birds can pretty much expect to see all of them. Um, you know, it, it, would be a, it would be a struggle. It might be a struggle to track down this gross beak. Um, I only just saw it recently uh, in Al-Baha uh, in my last, last trip. Uh, there's a trip report on my website for this. Um, it was, and, and this was my second visit uh, to, that, to that region where they had been seen before. And um, so I got lucky the second time. Uh, but, but elsewhere in the country, there haven't been sightings for maybe 20 years or, or more. Okay. So not only is it, um, uh, is the country uh, the easiest place to see these endemic birds, so endemic to the Arabian Peninsula, we can't see them anywhere else in the world. Um, there's also several near endemics that, you know, maybe they occur elsewhere uh, beyond the Arabian uh, Peninsula, but but still, Saudi is, is, is definitely the easiest place to, to see them, to get them, um, to, to encounter them. So um, examples of these are the uh, hypercoleus. Uh, this is a really incredible bird that, uh, that uh, occurs in the winter here. Um, but the, they, they breed in Iraq, Iran, and Afghanistan. So they're not the, the easiest countries to, to get into, uh, especially for just birding tours. Uh, but if you came to Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates uh, in the wintertime, uh, you'd have a good chance of, of seeing these birds. Um, then there's the Arabian lark, which we, um, which we met earlier. 90% um, of the population of this bird occurs in Saudi, which is why we call it a near endemic, that most of the population is in Saudi Arabia or the, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and um, so it, it, it can be hit or miss in places like Israel where it's occurred also, but uh, there are places in Saudi where you can, it's tough, but you can nearly expect to see it if you go to the right places at the right time. Um, there's the Rufus Cap Lark. Uh, this is another one that occurs in Yemen as well as the Somaliland. So Yemen, uh, on account of the conflict, is a no-go zone. Somaliland, um, I don't think is particularly tourist friendly uh, at the moment. So really the best place to see this bird is uh, the Southwest Highlands, um, the Rufus Cap Lark. Then of course we have the Arabian Golden Sparrow. This is a near endemic uh, in that it also occurs in Djibouti, uh, which is uh, on the African continent. Um, so I think maybe also even a little bit of Eritrea as well. But most of most of its population is found in Saudi um, in the the arid lowland areas around um, agricultural sites uh, in uh, southwest Saudi and western Yemen. Uh, we also have two. We also have two uh, endemic seabirds as well. So in the in the Red Sea, uh, we have the white-eyed gull. Uh, near, near endemic, near endemic, meaning that it's the Red Sea. Uh, they occur on the, the west side of the Red Sea uh, along Egypt and Sudan. Um, they also occur up north um, on the southern coast of Israel and Jordan, uh, but, uh, and um, also, of course, uh, the coast of Yemen. Um, but uh, there's good numbers of them in Saudi, uh, so they're quite easy to see, um, basically, 
the whole length of the coast of the Red Sea. Really, really striking, um, striking gulls. Uh, the, the yellow legs and the red beak is just too much, especially when you see it in person. It's just such a striking bird. Um, we also have here the Socotra cormorant. Um, so this is another near endemic that can only be found in the Persian Gulf uh, as well as the Arabian Sea. Uh, very, very rarely does it occur in the Red Sea. So mostly just those waters to the east and southeast of the Arabian Peninsula. Now let's get on to the birding hotspot. So um, let me see here, I got lost in my notes. But um, depending on where you're going to visit, uh, so there's a lot of reasons to, to visit Saudi. Uh, a lot of people will come in on, you know, maybe a business visa. Um, you know, they, they've, got, uh, they've got other purposes here besides birding, but maybe they've got a little free time. So maybe they've come into the Eastern region or this, this region here in the center, this is the Riyadh area, um, you know, for, for some business, but there's good birding wherever you go uh, in Saudi Arabia. Right. Um, so let's talk about these, uh, the, some of the best regions for birding in the country. And we'll look at some of the specialties that we can see in each region. So again, this is where I live uh, in the East. And here, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. I'm sure you can see all these images. Okay. So here are some of the specialties that uh, for the East. So where I live, um, I've included this, this is actually quite common in the West as well, uh, but where I live in Al Hassa, this is the easternmost site of the, um, uh, where the uh, black scrub robin, <clears throat> where the black scrub robin breeds, and they're just really comical, fun birds. Um, so anyone who ever visits uh, where I live uh, and, and wants, wants me to take them around birding, I always go to this one park where there's, you know, uh, nearly a dozen uh, of these, um, a dozen pairs of these easy, uh, you know, just so they can experience it. They're, they're quite fun, uh, the black scrub robin. Uh, we've got the gray-headed swamp hen, which we met earlier. That's uh, in the, the wetland areas uh, in the east. Um, the hypocoleus, this is a female hypocoleus. Like we talked about, uh, eastern Saudi is uh, one of the best places to see these in the winter. Um, the Socotra cormorant, again, um, you can only see it uh, in Saudi, you can only see it in the Persian Gulf. So you've got to be exploring along the coast there in the east. Uh, and that's when you'll see this, this near endemic seabird. Um, now we have the delicate prinia, of course. So we have both the graceful and the delicate prinia in eastern Saudi. Uh, so two prinia species, which is pretty exciting for, for birders in this part of the world. Uh, when they when they announce that they're actually indeed two separate species. Um, we have Egyptian nightjar. Uh, so at the lake that I showed you earlier, there's some desert terrain around the lake uh, that's really popular with these nightjars. And uh, during the summer, especially uh, late summer, they become um, uh, quite easy to find around the lake. I go out, I go out every year and find, you know, nearly two dozen of them uh, in every visit. Um, really wonderful birds. Uh, the mustache warbler, which we met earlier. Uh, this is one of the few places on the Arabian Peninsula uh, where they breed um, the, the lake site that I showed you earlier. And then these here are the sociable lapwings. Uh, so this is that endangered shorebird uh, from, that breeds in Central Asia and uh, a large portion of their, their global population winters in Saudi Arabia. Uh, so these can be seen in um, uh, pivot irrigation fields, but the, the, the grass needs to be just the right height to draw them in. If it's too short or too long, um, they, they won't be interested. So that, these are just some of the specialties in the East, but there's lots of really wonderful birds out here. Uh, when you get to the Riyadh region, um, the, the great thing about the Riyadh region is that there's, you get some really fantastic desert birding and then there's some really great um, wetland habitats as well uh, on account of the, the flow of uh, treated wastewater that comes out of the city. Um, so um, I'll sh show you some of the birds that you can find there. In the desert, um, trumpeter finch uh, are easy to find. These are really, really lovely finches. Uh, nice coral colored beaks. 
um, black red start. This is a, a bird that occurs through the west of the country and uh, 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 pretty much as far east as it goes um, is the Riyadh region. Uh, nice, nice bird, black red starts. Um, uh, Arabian lark. Uh, this is where I, uh, this region is where I saw my first uh, last year. Uh, there's an area that I know of north of the city uh, where they've actually been uh, discovered again this year. So I'm looking forward to going back out and seeing them. Um, this is the step eagle that I talked about earlier. Uh, so there's areas around, uh, there's areas north of Riyadh where congregations uh, upwards to 5,000 birds. Uh, they like to hang out, hang out around the dumps and, um, you know, uh, different sites where, you know, maybe um, uh, some of the farms may dump uh, some of the slaughter waste. Um, they said these birds will congregate there in huge numbers uh, around Riyadh. Um, the Basra reed warbler. Now this reed warbler, uh, I believe has bred uh, south of Riyadh uh, in a small area of wetlands uh, created by uh, wastewater, uh, treated wastewater. Um, it's, it's essentially to go there, it looks like a pristine river. It looks like it's been there forever. It's, it's really, really wonderful habitat. Um, and these, these warblers breed uh, the Basra region of Iraq uh, and Southwest Iran. Um, but they migrate through Saudi, pretty much straight through the Riyadh region on their way to East Africa. And um, when the conditions are right along the Riyadh River, uh, I believe that some actually, in fact, will stay and breed. I haven't proven it yet, but uh, the bird you see in the picture here uh, was, uh, was a male uh, that was singing and defending territory. Uh, and I believe there was even a mate um, with it in the same same area. Uh, I saw a second bird, it seemed there, like there might've been a nest. Uh, so it's yet to be proven, uh, but this is a bird that was uh, in decline. Uh, so a, a smaller population and on account of um, actions taken by Saddam Hussein uh, during, uh, I think it was the, it was during the second, it was in the 19, yeah, the early 1990s, so the first Gulf War, uh, but he destroyed a lot of the marshes uh, where these birds uh, bred uh, as a way to punish uh, a group of um, Iraqis, the Marsh Arabs, that had uh, taken up arms against his, his government. Uh, and on account of that, the, the destruction of those marshes, this, uh, the, the population of this bird uh, plummeted. Uh, but um, after the invasion of Iraq, um, uh, the the marshes were reflooded, and um, I think upwards to maybe nearly um, what they were, what they once were. Um, and now this bird has has rebounded in that time. Um, we've got the bar-tailed lark again. This is another one that's easy to see in the deserts, um, uh, particularly north of Riyadh. Uh, desert finch. Uh, this is a lovely bird uh, that can be seen down by the river and. Uh, that I mentioned, as well as uh, agricultural areas, uh, primarily to the southwest of the capital. Um, we do get the Arabian green bee eater in the center of the country, uh, but this is about as far east as they extend, because uh, these guys like to be sort of um, sand gravel desert with uh, primarily wadis, like, uh, um, like uh, canyons or valleys with acacia trees. Uh, they really love the acacias. And um, this area also, the wetland region south of the city is one of the few places in the kingdom where we reliably get uh, white-throated kingfisher uh, as well. So this is a great place to go and experience these wonderful desert birds and wetland birds. Um, I'm gonna jump up here to the Al Jauf region. So in Al Jauf, uh, where I'll actually be visiting next week for the first time, which is why all of the pictures here are from my friend uh, Nader Fahad Shimari, because I haven't yet visited. So I wanted to feature his photography. He's pretty much the only birder <laughs> in this region at the moment. Uh, but lots of really great um, uh, desert birds like the cream colored courser. This is the Temminx lark. Uh, looks like our horned lark back home. Um, we have uh, the uh, Mediterranean short toed lark, this one here. There's some uh, great Mediterranean warblers, which will winter, which will often winter in this region. Uh, this is the Rupel's warbler. 
uh, common wood pigeon, which is a common Eurasian bird. Um, this is, I believe, the only place in the kingdom where this is this can be seen easily. Um, Nader has found uh, little owl, um, so he has a go-to place uh, where he can, uh, where he's gotten these amazing photographs of little owl uh, near him. Uh, here's the thick-billed lark that I mentioned before. This is a really incredible bird. Um, you know, to see it out in in the desert, really rugged terrain, uh, to see a bird like this is just uh, jaw dropping. Um, we've got um, black winged kites, which are like our white tailed kites. I believe they're they're now considered separate species. They used to be considered the same species, uh, but these um, these black winged kites um, are now um, much more common in Saudi and particularly in the north where he lives. Um, and uh, Nader's area is the only place in Saudi where we can see the CC partridge. So this partridge ranges primarily through through uh, from uh, Iran, through Iraq, uh, into Turkey. Uh, and this is the only place uh, in Saudi where it occurs. And it's, it's a good, I think, uh, maybe 300 miles from the nearest uh, sighting of this in Ebert in, in Iraq. So it's uh, uh, quite a distance uh, from this normal range. Now uh, here also in the Northwest of the country is the Tabuk region. So this is near uh, this is on the Gulf of Aqaba. This is near the Sinai Peninsula, Jordan, Israel. And this region, really, really stunning. Another very wild region. Uh, there, is, there aren't too many uh, large cities up in this area. It's not too, um, too populated. Uh, this is a great place to look for desert owl, uh, which is, it's the only place I've seen it. This is not my picture though. Uh, this is a picture by another Saudi bird photographer by the name of Mansour, um, Mansour Fahed. Um, there's the Sinai rose finch, which is a regional endemic. Uh, it's found on the Sinai Peninsula, Israel, I believe Southern Jordan, and in Saudi as well. Um, this really beautiful finch. Um, we've got um, red, uh, this is the black red start. This is the Western black red start, in fact. Um, and so we get the Western black red start in the west of the country and in the east of the country, we get the Eastern black red start as, uh, as winter visitors. Really nice birds. This is the female. Uh, unfortunately, I should have added a picture of the male. Uh, the males are quite striking. Um, again, here's the Arabian sarin or the olive rum sarin. Um, this is an endemic bird that can be seen as far north as Tabuk. Uh, and I reckon one day that uh, Jordan and Israel will get there first. They seem to be expanding northwards. Uh, we have the Tristram starling. This is a bird that occurs from southern, from Israel, uh, south through Yemen. Uh, really incredible long-tailed starlings with bright um, uh, orange, only, almost orange creamsicle color in their in their wings and their their the, the tips of their primaries. Um, Tabuk region is the only place in Saudi, or the best place in Saudi, to see uh, chucker partridge. Um, so right up there in the north northwest, uh, hooded weed ear. Like this, this is a female hooded weed ear. It's um, this region is great for this species, as well as the Kurdistan weed ear, which is um, uh, I saw last year. It's another one that's really sought after by a lot of birders. And then of course here's another image, another bad image of the Syrian sarin. Um, this bird, they, uh, the global population is believed to be around 4,000. Uh, and um, when I discovered it, uh, I saw 50 uh, with my family. And I later found out that uh, other, other birders to the area saw 250 a flock that large. So it's, that's, that's a significant percentage of the global population uh, occurring in one spot in Saudi Arabia. Now this is where we get into, this is the Southwest. So once, let's start here with the Mecca region. So in the Mecca region, we start to see more of the uh, Arabian endemic. So we can see the Arabian wax belt here. We can see the Arabian weed ear in this region. Uh, this is highlands near the city, the holy city of Mecca. Uh, up in these highlands, we can also see the Arabian partridge. Uh, we start to see red-breasted weed, weed ear which is another one that has been proposed for separate species status. Uh, that's, um, it's, it, there, there are birds in Ethiopia, there are birds in Africa, but 
Uh, it's believed that this might be a distinct species from those. Uh, we have uh, interesting buntings here, the cinnamon breasted bunting, like the one featured here, as well as the striated bunting uh, that occur in this region. Uh, we have the Arabian warbler, uh, which is another near endemic that occurs in uh, Israel and Jordan, I believe. Um, but the bulk of the population is on the Arabian Peninsula, the Arabian warbler. Uh, we have the Arabian shining sunbird, which is another one that's proposed for endemic status uh, that can be seen. I saw someone say, are any hummingbirds over there? So yeah, and this is the answer to your question. Sunbirds are the closest thing to hummingbirds in Saudi Arabia. Um, they're really, really delightful little birds. Um, they, they go for nectar, they go for the insects um, uh, around um, uh, flowering plants, and they also have the iridescence of hummingbirds as well. So it's the closest thing we got to hummingbirds in Saudi Arabia. Um, there are three species. Oh, okay, 10 minutes. Okay, thank you, Ann. I'll, I'll pick up the pace then. Um, we, um, this is a good area for the Arabian woodpecker. And this is the, the only area in Saudi where we've seen the Arabian grosbeak in recent years. All right, I'm, I'm speeding it up, but I have to talk about the Asir region specialty. So uh, the Asir region, this is where the bulk of the endemic species can be found. So we've got the Philby's partridge again, the Arabian scops owl, uh, the Yemen sarin, uh, the Rufus Cap Lark, this is a great place to find them. Uh, the Yemen Warbler, right? The, the Arabian Eagle Owl, again. Uh, this is the, uh, the Yemen Linnet once more. Uh, the Yemen Thrush once more. And of course, the Asir Magpie. So this is the place to go in Saudi. Down here is called the Asir region. Um, and this is where most uh, visiting birders uh, will want to go. And then the extreme Southwest, this is where we get these African birds. So we have the helmeted, uh, helmeted guinea fowl. Uh, we have the African gray hornbill. Uh, we have the harlequin quail, which is an African species um, that occurs in the extreme Southwest. It's a, it's a distinct subspecies there. Uh, we have Abdeem stork, which is an interesting stork species from Africa that occurs here. Uh, the Abyssinian roller, which I mentioned before. Uh, the Arabian Golden Sparrow, which I also mentioned. Uh, we have lots of uh, interesting doves, uh, particularly in the Southwest, including the red-eyed dove, uh, which is an African bird, which occurs here. Uh, lesser flamingo. Uh, this, is the only, there's, uh, this is the only place in Saudi where you can regularly see this species, uh, the lesser flamingo, which is a, a common African bird. And the uh, Varroa's eagle, this incredible, they call it the black eagle in Africa. Um, credible um, eagle species that can be seen in the Southwest. Um, I think there's, yep. Now, um, so I'm just, just about to wrap up here. Um, so lastly, I wanted to talk about why I love Saudi birding so much. So as you can see, right, Saudi birds are cool. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of variety, um, just a lot of really interesting regional influences. Uh, the African birds, as well as the, the, the Indo-Malayan birds, really wild. Um, and it just makes me, it makes me excited to just hop on a plane and go visit uh, some other place uh, in Saudi that they haven't yet, just to see what else I can discover there. Um, the second reason I really love it is that Saudi is one of the most underbirded countries on the planet. Uh, so to illustrate this for you guys, uh, there, in eBird, there are 4,556 completed eBird checklists for Saudi Arabia. That's compared to Tarrant County's 69,100. So here's a little graph, um, bar graph to illustrate this, right? This is, these are the completed checklists for Tarrant County, and here are the completed checklists for Saudi Arabia. Um, so there's, <laughs> there haven't, there haven't been a lot of eBirds to visit the country. And many of the ones who did when I first got here, the records I was seeing were from basically Jim's time in the country, uh, in the 1970s, 80s, and early 90s. Uh, very little uh, from more recent years. Um, number of eBirders, right? 283 eBirders uh, in total um, um, uh, 
have reported over the years to eBird uh, compared to Tarrant County's 4,417 eBirders. Um, third reason I really love um, um, I really love Saudi birding is because there's been so few birders, so so few bird watchers who have visited the country, uh, and a lot of these birds are so understudied that even casual birders uh, can can contribute to uh, knowledge of Saudi bird life. So uh, I've taken up uh, audio recording, and with that effort, um, I've documented the vocalizations, uh, some of the first records of. Um, vocalizations for particularly the endemic birds of Saudi Arabia. So here's the Asir magpie, right? Uh, here's the Rufus cap lark. This is the only recording in existence, uh, as far as I know, online for this species. And, uh-oh. What happened to the rest? Oh, the zero of oh, the comments. Um, and then recently I recorded the delicate prinia in the Northeast of the country. Just some of the calls. Um, so that's that's really exciting. And, um, and with the audio, we're actually, um, we're actually uh, in the process of uh, boosting up uh, Merlin's uh, sound ID for the region. Um, but to do that, we had to, uh, we need to submit more audio to Macaulay Library uh, to help the, uh, the, the volunteers who are annotating the audio uh, to make it ready for incorporation in the Merlin, uh, the Merlin sound ID model. So um, it's, it's really important that people share audio of the birds as well as photos. Uh, so that uh, court, um, so that the eBird team, and the Merlin team, can develop these apps and, and help uh, spread the word. Um, I've also been sharing my love of Saudi birds with others through my website, uh, and as well as YouTube, and have been publishing uh, articles with some of the uh, some of the company publications, Saudi Aramco, such as um, this article in Aramco Life about the recent October Big Day. So this was our first ever October Big Day, and Saudi did did great. Uh, we were really excited. Um, in fact, we saw a total for the country, 221 species observed in a single day. And we had birders in all of these regions of the country out on October 9th, um, uh, documenting birds for the Big Day. This is the first time it ever happened in Saudi. Um, and then lastly, I love um, learning Arabic. Um, just been learning little by little over the past 11 years. And I've been sharing that with others through my, my YouTube channel, um, just teaching basic Arabic around birding and bird watching uh, in Saudi, um, featuring primarily Saudi Arabic as well. So the way people talk on the, on the, on the, the street here, as it were. All right, so sorry, wrapped up now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, shukran, shukran, jazilin. As we say in Arabic, uh, I'm happy to take your questions now. Hey, Greg. <laughs> so I, I've, I've been taking Hi, down so. some questions, so I've got a few for you. We can go through here. Um, sure, first sure. of all, um, you did get to one of them. Are there laws protecting birds in Saudi? There are laws, but um, like a lot of countries in this region, uh, enforcement is the big issue. Um, so, for example, there are laws about uh, illegal hunting, um, but, uh, but it, it happens quite often, um, especially out here. The, the lake that I showed you, there, there are guys out there, um, not, just, not just hunting birds to kill them, but also to capture them. Um, there's, um, there's illegal trapping of falcons here because falconry is very popular. Um, there are legal ways to capture falcons, um, but uh, because of the big money involved, there's also a lot of legal trafficking of these birds. Uh, and in fact, at the lake where I go birding, um, just this last month, October is the big time for the peregrine falcons moving through and uh, the illegal trappers, they know when there's falcons in the area. Uh, and they're out there and, um, you know, they can earn up to maybe $30,000 uh, for, for, for one peregrine falcon. So it's, 
it's a real serious issue and it's just a matter of enforcement. That's, that's really where it's lacking. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so we have two questions about weather. First of all, um, are the seasons the same? So your summer and winter, I know your northern hemisphere, so same times of year that they are here? Well, probably mm -hmm. minimalistic. And then, um, I would think in terms of latitude, latitude, it's similar to Florida. So when Florida can expect to start getting those shorebirds passing through, that's around about when they, when the shorebirds start showing up uh, wow. to Saudi. So usually the end of end of September, early October, we start getting our bigger, bigger waves of uh, migratory shorebirds. Okay. For and the fall migration, we, yeah. We saw a picture of you in a coat. So how cold does it get there? It does. Uh, it can get quite cold. Um, down to down to depends on where you go. Of course, uh, they they in fact get snow up in the Tabuk region in in the higher elevations uh, during the winter, usually around January. And then out in the east where we are, it can get down to sometimes maybe 45, 50 degrees at night um, during during the winter. And I, I'm thinking this question is for the desert species. So how do they get water mm. of those species that are endemic to the desert? The ones in the desert, um, they're, they're not uh, a lot. Of, oh, I wish I, I, I would honestly recommend you go to Christopher Boland's presentation about this, the birds of Saudi Arabia, because he's an expert in this area. Um, but obviously they're, you know, they're, they're going without water for a long extended periods of time. Uh, you know, an area in Saudi may not see rain, but perhaps once, um, once a year. So uh, these, these desert birds are getting most of their, um, pretty much all of their moisture from what they're eating, but then they're all specially adapted to retain that moisture. Um, and Chris uh, talks about this at length in his video. I'll find that and share it with everyone in the chat. Uh, but he talks about the special physiological adaptations that these birds have to help them retain water, which includes like specially sort of adapted sort of uh, fatty layer, I believe, in the skin that helps them really keep it in and not lose it uh, uh, to evaporation, which is, which is really, really intriguing. Yeah. And so is there a bird tour company in for Saudi or are you it? <laughs> good, good question. Um, I shouldn't be, I, I haven't, you know, at, at this point I've, I've kind of taken on the role of just helping people plan. And if they come to my area, I'm happy to take them out um, and show them around. Um, I did entertain the idea of, you know, maybe doing some professional guiding, but um, I've decided that my, my free time is way way more valuable than, than the money. And I'd much rather, you know, just take people out. And if I can join them in a place like the Southwest, then that'll be, that'll be fantastic. But to, to be a paid guide, probably not. But they, um, you know, there's nothing yet, despite the fact that the, the country is now open to international tourists, there are no dedicated eco tours targeting, uh, targeting bird watchers. Um, despite the fact that I know tons of European and American birders who are itching to get here. Uh, the only thing that really posed, uh, you know, um, uh, complicated that, of course, was COVID, because uh, it was it was a matter of months after the country really declared itself open to international tours that COVID shut it down. Um, so now now people can come. Uh, they need to be fully vaccinated, um, but they are they uh, and. Certain countries are still sort of red listed, but uh, generally most European uh, and North American countries can, um, can, can visit now, as long as they're vaccinated. All right, well, that wraps up our questions. Um, thank you, Greg, that was super interesting. We really appreciate you taking the time, I know from your evening, uh, so that you could present to us during the day. I'm gonna turn this back over to Anne to wrap up. Yeah, my, my pleasure, Amanda. Yeah, thank you, everybody. And apologize, uh, apologies uh, if, I, if I ran over. I never actually timed <laughs> myself. So, um, so apologies for that if I kept anybody. That's all right. It's, it's always oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining me. You did good. Thank you so much. And I guess we'll see everybody in December.
that Greg stay on because I want to see I have a, a question about where in East Fort Worth you're around. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, part of the reason I reached out to you is uh, just to have an opportunity to connect with the broader birding community. I know there's there's tons of uh, I, I might have met some of you, in fact, at the um, the Arlington drying beds. Uh, we're, we're just down the road from there. That's about 15 minutes. That's that's my local hunt. <laughs> oh, OK, <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I wanted to use it as an opportunity also to connect with folks and then, you know, maybe I can um, join you for some meetings or any any organized outings, you know. Well, you're always welcome um, when you're in town to come on any of our our haunts with us. <laughs> Great. I look forward to it. Yep. You can, you you can help me find the red-headed woodpecker. What other birds do you have that you want to get? Oh, there in Texas? Yep. Oh, goodness. Well, yeah, the, the, the ladder back would be nice to see around Fort Worth, the, the, the red-headed uh, woodpecker. Um, I want to get back for the winter for, for long spurs and whatever um, uh, the, the, the winter larks and uh, sparrows um, as well. Um, so mountain plover, I don't know how close to Fort Worth that occurs, but that's another Austin, one I'd like to see eventually. Austin, I think, is the closest that that comes around the Austin cool. area, Lake Granger. Somebody else yeah, will correct me on that. Well, yeah, I, I'll, I, be, I'll be sure to give a shout to the, to the, to the society, um, see if you guys can help me. Definitely, we, we look forward to meeting you in person. <laughs> yep, are you on our uh, newsletter distribution list? We can add I him. believe so. Yeah, please please add me if I'm not already yeah. on there. I thought I, I thought I saw an email from the, the general email, but uh, maybe it was only the one you sent to me directly. Yeah. All right, yeah, we'll double check and make sure Michael has your email address. Thank you again. Thank you. Again. Thank you, Amanda. So, Thanks, everybody. Thank Have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Ma salam, everyone. All right. So I'm going to end the meeting. And I was going to ask him um, because I live, I don't know if you know where the little store is or how familiar you are with Meadowbrook. Yeah. Uh, pretty, pretty familiar. Yeah, we've, I mean, I've only been visiting pretty much once a year, but. Uh, you know, I live we, by uh, the Rose Hill Cemetery. Where, so we're close to, we're close to 30, is it 30? Okay. Oh, so, yeah, wait, no, 30 is the one that runs through the north, right, towards Fort Worth? Uh, it then, runs from Fort Worth to Dallas going east to west. Oh, uh, okay. And then the one running north south is 35 or no, 820. 820. Sorry, 820. 820. Yeah. So we're we're west of 820, not not too far from maybe five minutes down the road from 820. Okay. To the west. You're, you're probably incredibly close to me. Because <laughs> that's yeah, we, where we are. We're near we're not too far from the uh the, the little grassland park. Uh, the prairie, the prairie land park. Which which one's that? The um, uh, Tandy Hills. Over. Yes, yeah, Tandy Hills. We're 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 not too far from there. Okay. Yep. I know right where you are. You by my brother-in-law because <laughs> he lives over there. Nice, nice, cool. You can take me out birding around there. But yeah, course, they just they just added a whole bunch to that park. They've because, added to it. That's interesting. Yeah, they had Channel 5 used to be up there a long time ago. And then Channel 5 consolidated, I guess, or moved over to towards Dallas. And so they just, uh, they were either going to develop that land, but the city bought it and added it to Tandy Hill. So there. Uh, okay, great. Is that, so that's where you see the, the, the radio tower? Yep just south of 30 so that they've added that area as well yep that's excellent yeah it's a, it's a nice spot for sure when people yep. aren't uh <laughs> i'm always i don't know i can't remember which forum I'm, I'm on where i keep seeing people complaining about the photographers and stuff like that. you're setting up for like the you know the photo shoots or whatever 
Yep. It sounds, sounds like it, it, it's a little annoying, I guess. Well, I didn't know if you wanted to talk to Jim or if Jim wanted to talk, continue his discussion with you about where you, you were. So that's why I didn't. I don't know if I'm still on here. My yes, picture is, are. oh, my picture disappeared on my screen. Nope, so I thought, I, I thought Ann might have canceled me out, Greg. So. <laughs> I would never do that. <laughs> Well, one of the, I mean, we, I, the furthest if we were allowed to drive, Greg, back then was uh, like we could go down to Hafuf to the caves, and that was about it. You know, uh, driving around on, in 18, 1980 was limited and restricted. And, yeah, uh, but I, yeah, yeah. So it was, uh, but we had full access between El Cobar and, uh, uh, to go from El Cobar up to where we were in Goslin. And I was just looking on Google Earth. And if you look straight north along the shoreline, zoom in on Google Earth, you'll see Goslin. It's the power plant still there. And Ross, Ross Tenora. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, that that's still yeah. showing, but it might not be as an active, as active, of, you know, because technology has improved. <clears throat> One of the problems we had up there that when you were talking, answering questions about, uh, moisture uh our biggest problem was the uh, manufacturers who supplied most of the electronic distribution equipment across the country on the east side didn't take into account that how high the humidity is every night you'd have you know the desert winds flowing easterly during the daytime but then at night we had a fog bank come in off of the persian gulf and it would just soak all of our insulators on our main uh power of distribution lines and then when the sand hit it they would arc over and it, it became one of the, it became a tourist attraction uh people would go out to watch the lightning bolts jumping 10 feet across the insulators <laughs> and then tripping Whoa. us off and uh it was seasonal it was primarily like mid mid fall mid spring and it, uh, when that humidity was a problem but you would see it collect on all metal surfaces and out in the jet off of the coast we were allowed to go hiking and i would go out and see in the early morning i would see moisture on the bushes and scrubs uh just inland from the 